Isaiah chapter number 10. Of course, this is a continuation from chapters 9 and, and previous. I mentioned before, you know, we, we started going through Isaiah 1, and, and I mentioned there's, you know, there's going to be different segments of the book of Isaiah that, that flow together and, and kind of go together and others that uh, where you're skipping then great periods of time or whatever before the next prophecy comes. And prophecies span more than just one chapter in, in most cases. So we're just going to continue here. And I'm not going to go too much into the, into the context of last week other than it was not overall a very positive chapter. Now there was that, that great prophecy, Isaiah 9, 6, right, of Jesus Christ to come, and there's that hope of, of, that, of that Messiah and of that Savior, but it's clear that that's not going to happen for time. Like, even, even in this prophecy, it's not, um, it's not something that was going to happen right away, and that God was focused on the, the punishment of his people because of their wickedness and their idolatry and everything else that they've been caught up in. And, and uh, honestly, Isaiah chapter 10, as, as we continue to get in this, and this entire chapter is essentially just more of, of God, of, you know, warning and, and telling the people what's going to happen because of, uh, of their unrighteousness. And, and it's prophesying the king of Assyria to come in and judge them. And, you know, Assyria it, it ends up taking Israel captive in Samaria, which is uh, the northern kingdom and, and they're taken captive before uh, Jer Judah and Jerusalem is. And, but they're still going to vex and, and kind of conquer Judah and Jerusalem. But it's not quite the same as the devastation that happens with the northern kingdom of Israel. But um, that's what's going on right now. And he's, and he's warning and prophesying of Assyria to come against Jerusalem. Because it hasn't happened yet. And that's, that's kind of a big overview. But let's dig into this. Verse number 1 of Isaiah 10. And uh, I'm sorry. I meant to mention this before I even started talking about the chapter because I missed an announcement uh, I keep forgetting about. We're having a preaching class on June 12th, okay, this uh, week from Saturday. And so every man, every man who's interested in coming to the preaching class is welcome to attend. Same form as we've done before, except we're doing things a little bit different now. I'm giving a few guys an uh, opportunity to teach the class instead of me teaching the class. So uh, Brother Devin's going to be preaching and teaching the preaching class uh, Saturday, June 12th. And hopefully you can make it out for that. So enough of the announcements. We'll go back to the sermon. Isaiah chapter 10, verse number 1. Look what the Bible says there. The Bible says, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, and that right grievousness which they have prescribed, to turn aside the needy from judgment, and to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, and that they may rob the fatherless. And this is talking about what the Bible talks about in many places throughout Scripture. And excuse me, how oftentimes you get a lot of really wicked people in power, and it's normally rich people that oppress the poor. And this is talking about you know people who are needy, people who are in want, people who, who have needs. Where, you know, the, the, the wicked people uh, who are ruling or judging are taking away the judgment. Like their judgment that would be righteous for them. They're taking that away. They're taking away the right uh, from the poor of my people that widows may be their prey. So they're making it easy to target these, these uh, you know, people who are not easy to defend themselves. Right? Widows, they don't have anyone really protecting them. Right? They're kind of all by themselves. And widows typically is going to be talking probably about a woman, not a man, right? So a woman who was married, now she doesn't have her husband around anymore. She's got no one there to really look out for and protect her. And those are the ones that evil, wicked people are going to target because they're easy marks for them. They just look at people, you know, really wicked people look at people like that going, wow, we could, we could make some easy money there. We could just stomp all over these people. We don't really care about them at all. And, you know, be aware of that. That there's a lot of, of spiritual wickedness in high places. There's a lot of really rich people in this world that want to make you think that they're so great and they, they're so wonderful and they, they give all this money to these charities and stuff. But honestly, what, they're tr what, they, what they are trying to do and what they often are doing are enslaving people. They're giving money to these organizations that want to keep the widow and the fatherless down. The Planned Parenthoods and all the the vaccinations and, and, and all that other garbage that's targeting the poor, that's targeting 
the needy, that's targeting this group of people. They make it look like it's all good and they're going to blow a trumpet, but in reality, they're not doing good to those people. And on a, on a higher level, too, even when it just comes to, to government and all these people who want to, you know, they pretend like they, oh, no, we're all for the poor, we're all for the needy, but then they get people just latched on to the teat of government and dependent on government and just waiting for their next handout instead of helping them. Because honestly, the, the, the true help for a person, for the needy, for the poor, is to get them work, to get them on the right path, to do what's right and to live righteously and to live godly, not just to sit on the rear end and collect a paycheck every month from the government. And while I'm speaking on government, I'm going to go back a step up here to verse number one, where the Bible says, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. So what's a decree? It could be a lot of different things. It could be a new law, right? They're making some proclamation. They're making some decree. And it's interesting, the timing on this, because as I was preparing for my sermon, yesterday I, I saw, because yesterday we all know was June 1st, and unfortunately, our, our extremely wicked, vile culture today has been, has been warped and changed to where now you've got, you know, th this really, really small group of people of perverts and pedophiles and disgusting, horrible, vile people have gotten the ear of corporations and other groups and governments thinking that somehow it's going to be advantageous for them to cater to this group. So now you start seeing all the rainbow flags, all the, the homo propaganda being pushed on us uh, during this month because it's, it's deemed sodomite month. And what kind of blew me away and, and gave me just a little bit, you know, um, just kind of woke me up even further to how far things have slid in, in our country is when I saw, I saw this post from Prescott Valley, the town of Prescott Valley. That's the town that I moved from to come here. The town of Prescott Valley. The town of Prescott Valley is really small. I forget the, the population is like 40, 50,000, something like that. It's, it's not a lot of people. It's up in the mountains of Arizona, in central Arizona. It's not some huge metropolis. It's not Phoenix, for sure. It's a smaller community. When I moved up there, one of the things I loved about it is, it was, you know, it's full of all these, you know, relatively conservative people. It's family friendly. So at least I thought it was then. It, you know, it's got this small town feel. You know, it's really safe and everything else. And and I loved it. There's one of the things I loved about that area. I thought, man, what a great place. And I loved that I didn't see sodomites all over the place. It was something that was very a rare event to see. It was something that I just felt like, you know, I feel a little bit safer here. There's a lot of places down in Phoenix and other big cities, you know, down in Atlanta, where you can just, it feels like you're in Sodom or Gomorrah yeah, yeah, yeah. just because of how many perverts are hanging around in that same area or whatever. Prescott Valley wasn't like that, but I saw this proclamation this decree on Facebook that I just, it blew me away. And I'm thinking, if, if this is taking place in, in this little town, that this little town, held, you know, and you know, all, you all know I'm not a Trump supporter, but they held this big Trump rally at the arena there because of the demand of all the people that were, that were there. But you know what? I guess it shouldn't really surprise me because Trump was pro-homo anyways. Because people have just been brainwashed now into accepting all this garbage. But what, I'm going to read this proclamation, which is exactly what, it, what it, I, I copied and pasted this. And it's from the town of Prescott Valley, from their official you know, Facebook page or whatever. And it says, Pride Month Proclamation. Received by local business owner Jonathan at the May 27th town council meeting. So town council has this meeting, and they give this local business owner this proclamation, apparently. That's what it says, received by. And here's what it says, and it's written in their legal terms. Whereas, 
Pride Month is an opportunity to peacefully raise society's awareness of current issues facing the community and celebrate sexual diversity through various social, educational, and community events. Now, how weird and wicked is that? Celebrate sex? I mean, what, like, what, like what type of hedonistic society in a small town is saying, yeah, we're just going to celebrate perversion. We're going to celebrate per And what's diversity? Well, it's all different types of it, right? So I guess, I guess people with animals, hey, let's celebrate. It's diversity. People with kids, adults with kids, it's diverse. Kids with kids, that's diverse, right? It's all these different diversity. Let's celebrate it, you stinking perverts. Amen. It's not something to celebrate. It's something to be abhorred. It's something to be hated. It's something to be shouted down. And you've got people in local governments trying to promote this garbage. And that's just the first whereas, the first paragraph. Whereas the first Pride March was held on June 28, 1970 in New York, a year after the Stonewall Riots of 1969, which later served as a catalyst for the gay rights movement in the United States and around the world. And whereas... In 1981, the first Phoenix Pride March was done in downtown Phoenix, organized by gay and lesbian activists to raise awareness of gay rights and has continued for almost 40 years. And whereas the town of Prescott Valley supports the LGBTQ community's right to live their lives freely and supports equal rights for all and recognizes June as a month of celebration of lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender questioning and supporters across our nation. Now, therefore, I, Carol Pelguda, mayor of the town of Prescott Valley, Arizona, do hereby declare June 2021 as Pride Month and encourage the citizens of Prescott Valley to observe, recognize, and celebrate the contributions LGBTQ people give to our country, state, cities, and towns, and to celebrate the diversity of all our people. Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees. Amen. Woe unto you, town of Prescott Valley. Woe unto all of you, towns and cities and governments that are promoting perversion. Yeah, yeah let's, let's celebrate. Let's celebrate the contributions of the LGBTQ and their contributions of defiling little children. Let's celebrate the pedophilia. Let's celebrate their... their their sexual perversions and disgusting acts and behaviors that the Bible says is worthy of death. Yeah, let's celebrate that. No, it's not something to celebrate. You want to find me celebrating anything about Pride Month, I'm going to be celebrating a gallows being hung up and a bunch of faggots being hung up on the pole and, and being put to death by the government. That's something to celebrate. LGBTQ people, give me a break. Celebrate. This is, this is insanity. This is insanity. People have no morals whatsoever just going, yeah, let's just, let's, let's be proud about it. Let's celebrate this. Unbelievable. Hey, woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees and that right grievousness which they have prescribed. That's an unrighteous decree. I, I, I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw that. I was like, really, that place? America's doomed. This is supposed to be some small town, some, you know, great place to raise a family. Nope. Guess not. Not if you're just welcoming and celebrating a bunch of perverts. Unbelievable. Let's keep reading here in Isaiah chapter 10, look at verse number 3. The Bible reads, And what will ye do in the day of visitation? And in the desolation which shall come from far, to whom will ye flee for help? And where will ye leave your glory? Without me they shall bow down under the prisoners, and they shall fall under the slain. For all this his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. And if you remember from last week, that was that phrase came up over and over again 
which is obviously a continuation of, of what we read in chapter 9, continuing to talk about God's judgment. And he's talking about the day of visitation, the desolation which shall come from, a, from far. It's an invading army that's going to come from a faraway land that's going to come in and visit and come upon the people and, and destroy them. It's the desolation. He's going to bring desolation to the area. And he says, to whom will you flee for help and where will you leave your glory? So who are you, who are you going to run to? There's nobody to help you. Verse 4 says, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners because they've turned their back on the Lord. They left the Lord as their defense, as their shield, as their righteousness. So now, who are you going to turn to flee for help? Because God's the one that's bringing this nation in upon you. Now where are you going to go? Hey, without me, they shall bow down under the prisoners and they shall fall under the slain. For all this, his anger is not turned away, but his hand is stretched out still. Verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of mine anger and the staff in their hand is mine indignation. And this is saying, and this is a topic that I'm going to probably spend the most time on this evening, is just the concept of God using foreign armies and, and foreign countries to bring judgment upon his people and upon any nation he deems that he needs to judge. And he uses this all the time. And America needs to not be so confident and, oh, we have the mighty military and, oh, we have all this other stuff. Because you know what? If God is against you, who can be for you? Right? If God, if God be with us, who is against us? Right? Who can be against us? Who, you know, we can do all things through God which strengtheneth us. But you know what? If God is against us, what arm of flesh are you going to trust in that's going to save you from the Lord? Doesn't exist. Though hand join in hand, though, though the whole world band together and unite, God could just snap his fingers with his word, just consume the entire population in an instant. If God wants something to happen, believe me, it'll happen. And if God's going to bring judgment, you have nowhere to turn. He's talking about using Assyria as the rod of his anger. That's the instrument. That's the tool that he's using to go now forth and judge his people, to go and judge the children of Israel. Verse 6, I will send him against an hypocritical nation. That's one of the things that makes him angry. There's the rod of his anger. Why is he angry? Because they're a hypocritical nation. Because they claim that they, they love the Lord. They claim that they worship the Lord. As we read on Sunday in Malachi, right? The same type of person, the same type of people, the same type of priests. They got dung on their face. That are saying, you know, oh, we worship the Lord. Yeah, we're holding these feasts. And their heart is far from them. They don't really believe this stuff. They're worshiping idols. They're doing all other things to, to, to make God angry. And they're just a bunch of stinking hypocrites. And against the people of my wrath will I give them a charge to take the spoil and to take the prey and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Howbeit he meaneth not so, neither doth his heart think. So this is talking about now the heart of Assyria. But it is in his heart to destroy and cut off nations, not a few. Assyria doesn't even need to know that they're being used of God. That doesn't matter. They've got their own agenda, but you know what? God is the one behind the, the, the scenes pulling the strings on Assyria going and judging the people. And I'm going to get into that. I'm going to expound on that a little bit more in just a minute. I want to keep reading some of these verses here. Verse number 8, the Bible says, For he saith, Are not my princes altogether kings? This is the heart of Assyria, is what this is talking about now. When he says, Are not my princes altogether kings? Right? And he's starting to compare himself to other nations. He says, Is not Kelno as Karkemesh? Is not Hamath as Arpad? Is not Samaria as Damascus? As my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols... And whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and of Samaria, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Wherefore it shall come to pass that when the Lord hath performed his whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high look. So basically he's saying, he, he's already saying, I, I've defeated Samaria, I've already defeated the northern kingdom, so... Can't I just do exactly the same thing to Judah and Jerusalem? Can't I just come in here? Just, I mean, what are they 
compared to everything else now that I've already come in and defeated. So he's going down there with this, with this proud heart, not even realizing God's the one that delivered him into your hand. Not giving God the credit at all. He's just starting to get more and more lifted up as he gets these victories and starts conquering people and lands. So he's approaching Jerusalem going, hey, I mean, I could do, why can't I just do the same thing to them as I've done to these other countries? And God's saying, you know what? After I've made my judgment, after I've brought in the destruction, after I've done what I want to do, the way I want to punish my people, king of Assyria is next. So it's not that God only is going to use some righteous nation to judge everybody else. He doesn't. And even when he brought the children of Israel into the promised land, he already said it's not that they were some righteous people. They, didn't, they weren't brought in there because of how righteous they were. He made a promise unto Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and he needed to bring the judgment on those wicked people of that land, which, which needed to be done, and he used the children of Israel to, to bring forth that judgment while simultaneously keeping his promise, but it's not because they were just some super holy, righteous group of people. Don't, don't forget, even after they got led out of Egypt, they were still turning their back on the Lord in the, in the wilderness, and God made them wander around for 40 years. So it's not like they were just all serving the Lord with all their heart, and that's why he led them in. There was a whole bunch of people, a whole generation of people had to die before he brought them into the promised land. So God uses, the whole point is that God uses nations that oftentimes are going to be much more wicked than the people he's judging even. So don't think, well, we're in the most righteous nation in the world, so God's not going to judge us. You better believe he will. You better, and you know what? He's going to use someone way worse. He could bring in the communist Chinese. He could bring in the, the, the Muslims. and the, you know, I mean, he could bring in anybody. Anyone he chooses to use. You think, oh, they, don't, they can't do anything to us. They, you know. If God wants it to happen, it'll happen. And it's so easy to, people get so lifted up and proud. I mean, the smallest things, though, make people just quiver in fear. Imagine not having power for like a week. What's that going to do to like all the people of the country practically? What do we do? They're going to be running around like, like they got their heads cut off, chickens with their heads cut off because they don't even know how to survive now without having power. That's a simple thing. These days, you shut down the gas. Just one gas pipeline. People are losing their ever-loving minds. Don't know what to do. And, and oh, wait, should we, should we trust in our, in our homo-affirming military to save us? Yeah, I want some flamer going out and fighting for me. When the enemies come, yes, yeah, send out the, the dykes and the queers and the fags. In fact, I mean, I actually think that's a good idea. Put them on the front line. Let's get them all out there. It'll be Operation Human Shield. Go forward, and, and you get the front. I'm for that. Boy, what a June that would be. <laughs> Let's get back into the passage. I don't know how I even got off on that at this point. He's using these nations. That's where it was. He's using these nations, wicked nations, to, to come and judge you know, his people and, and, and whoever he wants to judge. So God, God is in charge. Okay, If God wants something to happen, he makes it happen. So don't think that some wicked country can't come in here and punish us the way that God is punishing his people in Isaiah chapter 10. Verse number 13, the Bible says, For he saith, by the strength of my hand, I have done it. So he's, he's, talking, he's referring to the king of Assyria, right? So he's getting these victories, and the king of Assyria is saying, by the strength of my hand, I have done it, and by my wisdom, for I am prudent, and I have removed the bounds of the people, and have robbed their treasures, and I have put down the inhabitants like a valiant man. And my hand hath found as a nest the riches of the people, and as one gathereth eggs that are left, have I gathered all the earth, and there was none that moved the wing or opened the mouth or peeped. Basically, he's saying, you know, I've done all this up, and there's no one that even stood against me. 
I came in, I found all these riches, I did this, I did that, I removed the bounds, I robbed their treasures, I put down the inhabitants like a valiant man, I did all these things. No, God did that for you. You were just a tool being used. Now, this attitude, and we see this time and time again through Scripture, and this is, this is such a basic doctrine because this is found all over the place. Turn, if you would, to Daniel chapter 4. Keep your place in Isaiah 10, but go to Daniel chapter 4. Because this type of an attitude saying, oh, I did this and I did that and I'm the one who, who won these great victories and I'm the one, you know, this is all how, how wonderful that I am and how smart I am and how powerful I am, like a valiant man, I did all this stuff. This is a sure way to be abased. Now look, we're reading about some wicked king of Assyria, okay, but the attitude and the judgment can still be applied to you. Okay, you don't have to be a wicked king to be lifted up with pride and to think that, oh, all these great victories are coming because of me. Watch out for that trap. You may be having a lot of victories and spiritual victories and good things, right? Don't allow yourself to get full of yourself and lift it up into thinking, wow, everything's working out so great for me. Wow, I'm getting all these salvations. Wow, everything's great because I'm so good. That's not the reason why. It's because God's so good. That's why. That's why. We need to keep a humble spirit, a humble attitude as a servant and say, I'm going to keep serving. God, thank you for blessing. Thank you for, for, for protecting. Thank you for blessing me. Thank you for, for, for using me. Thank you for helping me to get these people saved. Or whatever, you know, whatever victories you're getting, whatever you're seeing being, being achieved and, and great victories that you're having and succeeding, God, thank you. Thank you. Not, well, it's because I'm so awesome. Now, it's going to take a lot of your hard work to, to get that, right? And, and to be used. I, I'm sure even the king of Assyria was doing a lot of hard work, right? I mean, he, couldn't, he wasn't just sitting on his haunches and going in and, and conquering people. He was going out there and, and, and you know, working and, and fighting and, and everything else. But, if you don't have the proper respect and, and, and the proper sight of what's really happening, you know, giving the credit where credit's due, then you may be next. And this, you know, this pride, hey, pride goeth before destruction and a haughty spirit, haughty spirit before a fall. There's your pride month for you. That's a comment I left too on, the, on that. I'm just, and, and, and I didn't expound anything. I didn't say anything. I just wanted to leave a Bible verse there just to see if anyone would even like it. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of people from my friends liked it, but I wanted to see if any, you know, like, like, is someone really going to say something against the scripture? A lot of people do. I mean, God haters do. But just, there you go. There's a Bible verse for you. That's not my thoughts. That's God's word. I, I'm waiting for someone to call me hateful because I, I quoted the Bible. I'm waiting for it. Oh, you're so hateful. Yeah, yeah. Just quoted the Bible. You want to claim pride? I'm waiting for your destruction. Because it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And that's why I'm not homophobic, because I'm not afraid of them. Go ahead. Fill yourself with more pride. Go ahead. You're going to be destroyed. You're going to have a, a great fall. King of Assyria found this out. You know who else found this out? Daniel chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar found this out. He had the same type of an attitude. He was used of God to bring judgment. He was used of God to establish that kingdom. He was used of God to do things God wanted him to do. But he thought it was all himself. Look at verse number 29, Daniel chapter 4. The Bible reads, at the end of 12 months, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? Talk about being full of yourself. I mean, think about that. Because I'm sure Nebuchadnezzar, no one else helped you either, right? 
You did all of that. It wasn't your armies and generals and captains or anyone else with you. It was all you, right? But look at this, verse 31. While the word was in the king's mouth, he's, not, he's like not even completely done speaking on how great he is. There fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And that's all God has to say. He speaks from heaven. I mean, imagine that, just getting God's attention to say, you know, after you just get done saying how great you are. I, I can imagine in, a, in an instant, his heart must have dropped to the floor, yeah. hearing the voice of God out of heaven. And yeah, you, you think you've accomplished all this? The kingdom's departed from you. So let's keep reading. Though. He says, goes on. Verse 32 says, And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. The same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of the days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes unto heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Now, before I continue reading here, Here's a picture. That, that kingdom is taken away from Nebuchadnezzar, and God gives him the heart of a beast. And for seven years, he's out, outside eating grass like oxen. And because of his exposure to the elements and because he's got this heart of a beast, I mean, he basically loses his mind. He goes crazy, and he's out there acting like an animal. Which, by the way, when God abases someone and brings them low, he makes them act like an animal. Which, another thing, you know, these perverts that want to say, oh, these animals have these same-sex relationships. Yeah, you're acting like an animal because you've been brought down, you've been abased to act like an animal. Yeah. Animal, animals have no control over their appetites and their desires and their fleshly lusts. You're a beast. You're an animal. God made Nebuchadnezzar like an animal to, to the point where his hair is, like, is, is becoming like a bird's feathers. You know, it's all matted and nasty from just being outside, not being well camped, not taking care of himself. His nails are just growing out and becoming like claws, like a bird's claws. And, and he's just looking, he's becoming to look like a beast. He's acting like a beast because God made it so, because God wanted to bring him down. And as soon as he gets his, he comes back to his senses, as soon as he gets his understanding back and God finishes his, his uh, punishment on Nebuchadnezzar, the first words out of his mouth are saying, praise God. Because he's been in that state for a long time, and it took him, you know, those seven years, he, he realizes, you know what, this, is, this was not me, this is God. God gets the credit, I'm going to praise God right now. He was humbled. It worked. And you know what, praise God. Like, you know, people need to be brought down that low. Unfortunately, sometimes people need to be brought down that low. But, you know, thank God, I would thank God to be, to be even if you have to, you know, hopefully you don't have to be brought down that low. But hey, if that humbles you to, to put your trust in God and understand who God is, then great. Unfortunately, there's still some people that never will humble themselves and never will recognize the Lord. But he does. So he says, you know, he lifted up his eyes. Because I bless the Most High. I praise and honor him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Verse 35. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. And he doeth according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? At the same time, my reason returned unto me. And for the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me. And my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. 
That's the lesson to be learned. All those that walk in pride, he is able to abase. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 9, because I want to I want to clear this up as well. I'm going to read from Isaiah 10, just the next verse, verse 15. The Bible says, shall the axe, this is, this is God talking about how he's using Assyria, and Assyria's got this stout heart, this proud heart, right? And just as God used Nebuchadnezzar, just as God has used other, God used Pharaoh. God lifted Pharaoh up to show his mighty arm, to show his strength, to prove a point to show how strong God is because Pharaoh was, was so obstinate and his heart was hardened, God made that happen. God hardened his heart so that he could continue doing all those miracles to show who the Lord really is and to show how mighty he is. God made that happen. Now look, we're not Calvinists here because Calvinists take this teaching too far. They take this too far. But don't go the other direction and say, well, God doesn't really do anything in this earth. Right? God has given us free will. Yes. God's given us free will. He's given us ability to choose to do things and, and to choose to serve him and choose to believe on him and everything else. But you better believe that there's a king in heaven that rules. And he lifts up and he brings down. And he can use his people as his instruments and as his tools as he sees fit. And that's what Romans 9 is talking about, by the way. It's this concept. But, but you know who we see God using and doing this with? It's always these rulers. It's always people. He, he's raising up people from, from humble beginnings. So, so whether, it's, whether it's wicked rulers or, or righteous rulers, right? The righteous rulers... He raises up and nurtures from humble beginnings and, and, and puts them in a position to be able to do his will, right, for good. But here's the thing. With, with that, they still had the choice to serve the Lord or to believe on him. God, in his foreknowledge, knows the hearts of man. And God is capable of choosing who he wants to knowing that they are going to accept him, knowing, you know, everything about them, and then choosing them to be his vessel to, to work good or evil. He knows people like Pharaoh are going to reject him. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows the end from the beginning. You know, he knows it all. So in, in his infinite wisdom and knowledge and foreknowledge, is able to make things work together as he sees fit. Now, it's hard to wrap your mind around how God knows everything, because this is and this is where this is where the Calvinist major fail is, is you start trying to to logic and reason through, which I'm not saying logic and reason are bad. I I, I think logic and reason are good, but when you start just getting into your own understanding and trying to understand things without just relying on what the scripture says. You can find yourself contradicting strict scripture because you don't know how to understand the way that God works. And this is fundamental to who God is. There is no reason the Bible would say, whosoever will, let him come freely, if it was impossible for a person to will to do that without God making you do that. That makes no sense at all. It's a complete contradiction. These people who are these hyper-Calvinists that want to tell you that, well, no, God already determined from the beginning who's going to be saved, who's going to be damned. He picked and chose it. You didn't have any part in that. You didn't decide anything. You didn't actually, when you believed on Jesus, it's because God made you believe. You know, that's nonsense. And that's contradictory to Scripture. But it's, it comes from trying to grapple with and try and understand how you can read passages where God is, is essentially just saying, hey, look, I rule. And if I'm going to lift people up, I'm going to lift them up. If I'm going to bring them down, I'm going to bring them down. I do these things, and what are you going to do about it? You can't do anything about it because I'm God, because I'm the Lord, and I'm going to do these things as I see fit. So trying to reconcile that with having a free will, you know, Calvinists fail in this regard. But both are compatible one with the other. Again and again, it has more to do with God's foreknowledge and understanding of people 
and sitting in the position that he sits outside of time, whereas we are locked into time. So, and I don't want to get into this huge, you know, discussion on this, but we could just simply go to the scripture. And that's what I'm saying. We need to, you know, before you, you try to make your head hurt trying to wrap your mind around how everything works exactly, let's just believe the scripture for what it says. So when God says he brings, lifts people up and brings them down, we could believe that. But when God says that there's free will offerings and that you have a free will and you can choose and whosoever believeth, you know, we believe that too. And they're, and they're not contradictory. You just have to understand how it all works together. Now, Isaiah 10, 15 has this in interesting passage. You're in Romans 9. Stay there. He says, Shall the axe boast itself against him that heweth therewith? Or shall the saw magnify itself against him that shaketh it, as if the rod should shake itself against them that lift it up, or as if the staff should lift up itself as if it were no wood? So he, he's talking about these instruments, these tools, standing up against a person actually using them, right? Like, like how is the axe going to boast itself? Just, just some tool, an axe, right? Wooden handle, metal head, going to stand up against the person who's using the axe. Like, that's silly. It's just an axe. There's, no, there's nothing that it can do. And he's saying, you know, same thing with a rod. You know, there's a person shaking the rod. The rod's just a piece of wood. And he's saying... Shall the, the staff should lift it up itself as if it were no wood. Like, it, like you think you're not just a piece of wood? This is how he's describing the king of Assyria. He's saying, you think you're somebody? You think you're going to turn against me? I'm the one using you. You're just my tool. You're my instrument. You're my arm of flesh to, to go over here and do what I want you to do. Don't you think that you're anything and that you can just do whatever you want without me allowing it to happen? Because I got something, some news for you. You're just my instrument. That's what he's telling him. And this is the understanding that we need to know because Romans 9 is the place that Calvinists are going to turn to to try to prove their Calvinists. One of, the, one of their main passages is Romans chapter 9. But even in the context of Romans 9, so we read about Nebuchadnezzar. We're reading about the king of Assyria. The, the Pharaoh, I'd mentioned him, is the same exact way. I'm not, we're not going to read that whole story just for sake of time, but you, you, hopefully you know the story already. Pharaoh was lifted up. God was, gave him a hard heart and, and did that on purpose so that he could show his might and his power. When God chooses to do this, he's doing this with these rulers. He's doing this for this big impact, right? We don't see God just doing this with every person on the earth, right? Just make, you know, well, I'm just going to make you hard. I'm going to make you, you know, no, he's doing this in specific situations and he's doing this with the rulers of the world too, right? So there's, there's these rulers that God is lifting up and the Bible talks about that. Okay. About, about rulers. It's not every human being in the whole world. And it's not as if they didn't have their own ability to be able to put their trust in Jesus, to put their trust in the Lord. They had that opportunity as well as anyone else did, but they rejected. Pharaoh had the opportunity to believe Moses and Aaron when they came to him. Because when you read the story, he hardens his heart first. God doesn't start off by hardening his heart. He does end up hardening his heart, but there's plenty of opportunities where it says Pharaoh hardened his heart. He hardened his own heart. He was already making himself hard and obstinate against the word of the Lord. That's his doing. And then God just said, okay, you want to harden your heart? I'll harden your heart. Verse 17, Romans 9. And this is important context too as we get into this because he's bringing up Pharaoh. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even for this same purpose have I raised thee up that I might show my power in thee and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth he yet find fault, for who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say to him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel an honor and another unto dishonor? 
What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. So this is a, another explanation or another way of saying the same thing. You know, the act boasting himself against that him that hews with it. He's saying, look, the potter has power over the clay. God's able to lift people up and bring them down as he sees fit. If God wants to bring up a ruler and allow, and this is what he says here, endures with much long suffering the vessels of wrath. So allows them to continue. God is allowing them to continue. Instead of just bringing the destruction swiftly on them, he's using them for a purpose. He's using them for a cause. He's allowing them to continue. God's able to bring people. Think about it this way. Let me, let me explain it this way. Think about the righteous, because people don't have as much of a problem with the righteous people as they do with the wicked people being hardened. Right? Because they, they want to say, oh man, well, how could you, you know, if God just chooses to harden your heart, then it's just going to be hardened. And, and that's where people have the problem. But think about how God has raised righteous people. Think about how King David came into being a king. Right? The humble beginnings. God chose him and nurtured him and, and made it for him to become king. And many of the righteous kings that, that we read about in Scripture... How about Joseph to get to the position that he was in? That's even a more extreme example of God working in someone's life to ultimately bring them to a position of, of where God wanted them to be. Now, I don't believe that God was making Joseph make all the decisions that he made to get to that point. I don't think God made Joseph be what you know um do good while he was a prisoner do good while he was a servant do, you know joseph was doing good because it was in his heart because it was it was he, he was doing what he thought was the right thing to do and god knows that because god knows his heart so he's the perfect person for god to want to use because he knows him and he knows what he's going to do it's not that god was making him do right in order to prop him up to be the king, to do what he wanted him to do. The same way, wicked people, God's not making them do wickedness. He's not waking, making them be evil, bad people. They've chosen, decided to become an evil, wicked person themselves and to make bad decisions and to turn their back on the Lord and to not receive God and to do whatever they think is right, which is, you know, not following the word of the Lord. And God knows that about them, yet he was still able to put them in these positions to get them into power because he knows their heart and he knows that they rejected him and then he could harden their heart and do things and have them rule the way that he wants as well. So he, could, he could lift up who he wants to to put in the position of power because he knows how they're going to react and how they're going to respond and what they're going to do. And he places people as he sees fit. That's how God operates. So he's fully capable of bringing up one and bringing another down and bringing one down, bring another up and, 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 you know, manipulating people in that sense because he puts them in these positions. It's strategic, but at the same time, it's not violating the will of an individual. Hopefully you understand that. I mean, it's not... It's one of those, you know, slightly more complicated things and, and, and can get you maybe a little confused when you spend too much time on this, just trying to figure out everything, how God operates. It's really not that complicated, but, you know, don't be deceived by the Calvinist crowd because they, they get really far away from Scripture. I mean, they'll point to a few scriptures like this, but then they go on and on and on trying to reason and logic, and you're going to find faulty logic like, the, I mean, the biggest one, I think the most glaring faulty logic that, that should hopefully seal the deal for you is that when they take things to their logical end, they come, they come up with this conclusion of basically grace uh, happens, like you receive grace before you have faith. 
that, that the grace comes before faith. We receive God's grace through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We, we receive that forgiveness, but in, in the Calvinist way of thinking, it's that, that grace that God gives you the ability even to believe on Jesus. So it's like he chooses you and saves you, and then you put your faith in Jesus. Because you have to, because who can resist his will? That's what they say, which completely contradicts the order in which the Bible says that salvation happens. First, you put your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he gives you the eternal, eternal life. Then he gives you that gift. And the gift is eternal life. The gift isn't faith. So I don't want to spend any more time on Calvin. We're already running really late. I didn't think it was going to take this long. All right, back to Isaiah chapter 10. Let's finish off this chapter. There's a lot of verses here, but I'm not going to spend a lot of time on each verse because there's, it's kind of a lot of the similar concept continuing to be described here about God using the king of Assyria and um, how God's going to not only judge Jude and Jerusalem, but he's going to judge the king of Assyria. Then look at verse number 16. The Bible says, Therefore shall the Lord, the Lord of hosts, send among his fat ones leanness. And under his glory he shall kindle a burning like the burning of a fire. And the light of Israel shall be for a fire, and his holy one for a flame. And it shall burn and devour his thorns and his briars in one day. God's going to make a big purge. The thorns and the briars, the wicked people, they're going to be burned up and, and, and wiped away. And it says, And shall consume the glory of his forest and of his fruitful field, both soul and body, and they shall be as when a standard bearer fainteth. The standard bearer is the, the person bearing the flag, like in, a, in, a, in, a, in an army, in a, you know, in a war, in a battle. They're kind of, you know, bring, you know, kind of helping lead people on. And then when they faint and fall over, it's not a good sign, right? Because people are um, going to see that and, and, and kind of cause fear in their heart. But it says that that's gonna, what it's going to be like is when that standard bearer fainteth, and the rest of the trees of this forest shall be few that a child may write them. Now, and, and what I think this is teaching here, that a child may write them, because it's kind of a weird verse, is that basically he's talking about this land is being decimated. And as we're going to see here in just a minute, it talks about a remnant being left of the children of Israel. So there's going to be this small remnant left. And imagine just, just a whole forest, but it's full of thorns and briars, and it's all going to have this consuming fire go through it. But there's still some trees that are going to remain. But there's so few, when it says a child can write them, I think it's like a child can count them. A child can just, can, can record that. They can write down, you know, a forest, a child's not, I mean, a child can only count so high, right? A child can only handle so many different things. But there's going to be so few left. You say, yeah, even a child can record that. Yeah, there's, there's like five trees standing. They can handle that. That's the, the utter destruction that's being described here, talking about a child uh, may write them, verse 20, and it shall come to pass in that day that the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped of the house of Jacob shall no more again stay upon him that smote them, but shall stay upon the Lord, the Holy One of Israel, in truth. So now he's saying, you know, that remnant, the people who are finally left over, they're finally going to get it, and they're going to go back to relying on God and not relying on the people who are smiting them. I mean, Israel's done this so many times, it's like they go back and run to Egypt, and they go back and run to these other nations that have already, you know, done bad things unto them, and they're going back to these oppressors. It's like, stop going back to the oppressor and relying on them to defi defend you and protect you. Go back to the Lord. But it says here, that, that, then they will go back to the Lord. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob, unto the mighty God. Now, that's what God wanted the whole time, but unfortunately, they had to go through a lot of heartache and pain and misery and suffering to get to that point. We want to learn the lesson of not having to go through that. Let's not be like the children of Israel requiring being brought down really low before you go back and turn, turn back unto the Lord. We need to stay with the Lord and continue to rely on him as our, as our stay and as our strength. Verse 22, for though thy people Israel be as the sand of the sea, yet a remnant of them shall return. The consumption decreed shall overflow with righteousness. For the Lord God of hosts shall make a consumption, even determined in the midst of all the land. Consumption is, is consuming, right? I mean, he's just going to make this huge consuming. 
Therefore, thus saith the Lord God of hosts, O my people that dwellest in Zion, be not afraid of the Assyrian. He shall smite thee with a rod and shall lift up his staff against thee after the manner of Egypt. So now he's telling them, don't be afraid of the king of Assyria. He's going to come against you and he's going to smite you. He says, it's coming, but don't be afraid of him. Verse 25, for yet a very little while and the indignation shall cease in mine anger in their destruction. So he's saying, my, my anger is going to run out. Don't worry about it. Like, like I'm going to make an end of this. And uh, just don't fear him. It says, verse 26, And the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck. And the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So he's basically informing them the king of Assyria is going to be destroyed, that God's going to take care of him. So while he is going to come with the rod, you don't need to be afraid of him because God will deal with him. And then he says he has come to Aath, he has passed to Migron at Michmash, he hath laid up his carriages. They are gone over the passage, they have taken up their lodging at Geba. Ramah is afraid. Geba of Saul is fled. Lift up thy voice, O daughter of Galim. Cause it to be heard unto Laish, O poor Anathoth. Madmina is removed. The inhabitants of Gebim gather themselves to flee. As yet shall he remain at Nob that day. He shall shake his hand against the mount of the daughter of Zion, the hill of Jerusalem. Behold the Lord. The Lord of hosts shall lop the bow with terror. And the high ones of stature shall be hewn down and the haughty shall be humbled. This is the theme of this chapter. The pride, the prideful are going to be brought low. And even though he may use these wicked people to bring judgment, he's going to use the king of Assyria to bring forth the judgment. He brought forth the judgment against the northern kingdom of Israel, and he's going to bring them against Judah and Jerusalem. But you know what? God is going to bring him low. And, and he's going to lop off that top bough. I mean, he's just a bough is a branch, right? He's talking about this big branch from a tree, and he's going to lop off that big branch with terror. He's going to terrify the king of Assyria. And the high ones of stature shall be hewn down, and the haughty shall be humbled, and you shall cut down the thickets of the forest with iron, and Lebanon shall fall by a mighty one. God will make sure that things go the way he wants it to go. And God's people need to understand, hey, don't get lifted up with pride. Don't, don't get so proud in our country and in our nation and our military and, and everything else, especially when your country and your military and your government is all turning to the, to the proud of the land, is turning to the God-haters and promoting and, and exalting all manner of wickedness and filth. Look, I went, you know, we ought to be getting on our knees and just begging God to protect us. Protect, protect your people, Lord, because we still love you. We still care about you. We're trying to do what's right. God, bring the judgment on a wicked people. People need to understand and get the fear of the Lord. And if they're not going to get it through preaching, if they're not going to get it from church, then God himself is just going to have to bring that fear and terror upon people. And you know what? I don't look forward to that day at all. Because it's not going to be good for us either. But I just pray and I know that God will keep us and protect us through whatever judgment he wants to bring. There's still going to be a remnant of his people that are still going to be left standing in that forest when God brings through the destruction. Let's make sure that we're not consumed in the consumption when he decides to bring his judgment upon this country. And let's, let's do what we can to proclaim the word of the Lord, to proclaim these warnings, as God has done all throughout history. Hey, even if this is a stiff-necked and rebellious people, that, our job doesn't change. Our job doesn't change. So our eyes have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for teaching us all these truths, Lord. We know that history repeats itself, and um, that's evident but we thank you for giving us uh, your words and giving us all these, these lessons that we could learn. 
I pray that you would just help us to stay strong, help us to be righteous, Lord, help us to, to stand for the right ways in the, in the old paths, dear Lord, and that you would um, use us as you see fit. And God, we, we know that, that your anger is, is got to be continuing to, to boil over, reach a, reach a boiling point here with, with this wicked country. And we, we thank you for your long suffering and mercy. And um, Lord, you know the, the end from the beginning. Use us as, as you would, you'd have us to do your will and uh, continue to just, just teach us and, and help us to, to know the, the right path, Lord. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.